What's up, YouTube? Uh, I am here today with something a little different. We are doing a book reading. According to Twitter and YouTube uh, community tabs, they did a poll, and everyone pretty much said yes. They want to see with, uh, the first couple chapters of the book I'm reading. Or uh, writing. Reading and writing. Well, today I'm reading it to you. It, it goes hand in hand. So we're live over on Twitch for my four-year anniversary, and uh, we're going to do it here live. So uh, to those who are here, enjoy live dramatic reading by yours truly. <clears throat> All I can see is black around me, but I hear distant screaming and gunfire. I hear movement coming towards me. Suddenly, I feel someone grabbing hold of me and started sh starting to shake my whole being. Jackson, get up! Earth to Jackson! We have no time to rest. The enemy group is pushing up and we still need to get to the contractor. Sorry. We still need to get the contractor... Uh, oh, oh god he's it's man i don't know how to read it's still the same guy we have no time to rest the enemy group's pushing up on us we still need to get the contractor out of here i slowly came to now i'm reading it seeing the warring battlefield in front of me blown back from a mortar shell explosion i slowly gather my wits and stagger back onto my feet in front of me members of the mystic wolves are fighting another well-known mercenary group known as athena's warriors and are leading a frontal charge against the compound we are hired to protect. Due to the sheer number of enemies, we had to pull out and protect our contractor by any means necessary. Jackson! Get the receiver and explode those damn landmines! I look over at my dead comrade to see a trigger device in his hand. I start to move towards the body. Bullets start to whiz over my head, causing me to fall into the dirt. I slowly start to crawl through the blood-soaked dirt. All I can smell is death and gunpowder. It was like my nose was stuffed to the brim with the stench of decay. With the stench and decay. And none of it seemed to face me. I crawl slower, or closer and closer as fast as I can. I reach out for the trigger and then at that moment, a grenade lands 300 yards from me. As the explosion goes off, dirt is thrown into the sky like a firework. My ears are ringing and with a piercing shrill and my body somehow feels paralyzed. I muster up the courage to keep going. I finally grab the controller and press the button on top. In a distance, small explosions start to go off. Almost in rapid succession, which is followed by screams in the distance and rain made of blood. We gotta go, Jackson! The contractor's in the airship and leaving! We are heading back... We are heading out the back and going down the ravine! I'm trying. Just as the grizzled senior said that, he grabbed me by the belt and pulled me to my feet. The salt and peppered, bearded mercenary started to run towards the blown open gate. I start to dash after him, running down the stone and brick pathways that run out throughout the courtyard of this mansion. Once we hit the gate, we are jumped into a slide into a slide down motion. I think it was supposed to be down a ravine as we reached the bottom of the ravine we saw in the distance a wave a wave ornamental truck with more members of our group waving to us to hurry onwards me and a grizzled mercenary and a dash when a mortar shell landed near us blasting me into a nearby wall causing me to black out now i will say this is not perfect i am not an english major this is just a casual writing and if I actually do end up going somewhere with this, it will be sent out. So things will be fixed. As I know there's an English major in my chat right now throthing at the mouth. <clears throat> at the moment I hit my head, I proceeded to wake up from the hard nightmare. I seem to keep reliving over and over again. As I start to clear my, clean my eyes, I remember that I'm on a train that is currently cutting through this beautiful countryside of Galeria. Farmlands filled with various crops from pumpkins to grapes and everything in between as well as Every, anything you can imagine. It is almost directly out of a kid's storybook. Stony brooks, old brick bridges, wooden farmhouses that's surrounded by cattle. As I continued to stare at the breathtaking countryside, a voice came over the intercom of the train. We will be soon reach. We will soon be reaching the town of uh, Aragale. Aragale. Make sure to take all your trash and belongings with you once you reach the station. Make sure to take all your trash and belongings with you. 
at the notice coming over the intercom, I started to straighten up in my black leather seat. The train cart is as standard as it comes. Black leather seats, wooden benches. They're painted green with gold studs holding the leather in place. Regular glass windows giving us a peek out to the outside world as the outside world that rushed past us. This is the first part. This is the first time that I've actually ridden a train this long and not be abruptly pulled off or protecting someone's life. It's actually it was nice to actually take in the scenery for once. I leaned my head onto the glass to see the station in the distance. From what I could see, it seemed mostly to be made of brick and mortar. I stand up and start to gather the luggage from overhead. I brought along three bags with me, a brown rucksack, a black hard shell rolling suitcase, and a sword case. As I start to gather everything to get as I start to gather everything together, I feel the train to slow starting to slow down and the forward gravity starting to catch up with the patrons on the train. As the train stops and a small jerk unbalances the patrons gathering the luggage, a load from a load from all the wave steam is let out from the engine, signaling that the train is officially stopped. The doors open in front of me and I step out onto the man-made brick platform, getting a nice deep breath of the country air with a slight slant, scent of flowers sneaking in. As I walk down the train platform, I see some of the hustle and bustle of the town of Aragel has to offer. There's all types of people who come through, either dropping off packages, transferring trains, or they're staying the night for any given reason. As I make my way to the station lobby, I pass a couple students in blue and green uniforms with a crest on it. Due to the location of the uniforms, I was unable to... I was unable to make out the design. It wasn't hard to put together that they were here for... They are from Vesquin Military Academy, the place where I will spend the next four years learning as a, and as the old man said, making a life of my own. As this thought crosses my mind, I hear the train starting up, the wave orbs whirling, which is causing the wheels to slowly build up momentum. I watch as the train started to build up speed and it makes its way to the next destination. I am curious of what different color, what the different colors of, for the uniforms I am curious on what the different colors mean for the uniforms, but we'll find out soon enough. I step through some double doors into a generic looking train station. There are a couple green benches with red cushions, an info kiosk with brochures on different things for the local area, as well as the counter where the train employee is there to take money for the tickets and answer any questions you might have. Then I see another set of double doors that seem to be made of heavy, so solid heavy wood. As I push the doors open, I get blinded by the sunshine that is to which I instinctively hurry to cover my eyes. I slowly walk fo walked forward as my eyes slowly adjusted to the brightness of the sun. Once I could see, I saw what looked like a small but quaint town, and I was greeted by blooming flowers and trees. Directly in front of the station is a fountain surrounded by red and blue flowers. Some park benches are nearby so people can sit and take in the atmosphere. There is a small cafe and bakery off to the left of the fountain. The giant, the giant wooden sign said, Ilaria's Cafe and Bakery, followed by a cute hand-drawn bear eating what seemed to be a loaf of bread. To the immediate right of the station was a foundry simply called Matai's Foundry, which was made of brick and mortar, but painted royal blue for some reason. In the back of the building, you can see plumes of smoke coming out of the back of the shop. Directly across from the foundry, and to the left of the station, is a general goods, general goods store called Darrington's General Goods. Which, out of front of the wooden building, there are small different stalls full of fruits and other types of produce that seem to be locally sourced and displays... And the displays seem to be well put... There, well built out of some pretty good wood. I also saw a man putting out different types of clothes, and such as dresses and jackets, along with different little items for everyday use. I guess he's getting ready for an event of some sort. Then I proceed to notice banners hanging all over the city, mostly in the lamppost, along the pathways. It's, black, it's a black and red banner with a crest in the middle, a shield with two horses centered in the, with two broadswords crossing over, and a star located dead in the center. 
I start to make my way down the rough brick stairs into the main plaza of the town. I can hear distant laughter of children playing behind some buildings nearby. As I walk towards the inn, I start to hear what seems to be water running through the town. It seems a nice, quiet, seems like a nice, quiet place to fish or catch dinner, you know, something of that nature. I added my own words there, sorry. I continue to make my way into the inn. Townsfolk pass by with positive greeting all around. They don't seem to be surprised by my rough battle, my rough battle-worn exterior. I walk up and open the door to the inn. I was immediately hit in the face with the smell of home-cooked food and the smell of all different types of alcohol. The Guilford Tavern and Inn is a mid-sized building full of cozy home, full of a cozy and homey vibe. The glass stay flowing even though that it's currently 1 p.m. in the afternoon. The lady behind the counter looked like she was in her mid-twenties, about five foot eight. She had long black hair that is tied into a French braid, light green eyes, light brown skin with dimples, as she just smiled taking in, talking to the regulars in front of her. She saw me coming in with a luggage, with all the luggage in tow, and calling out to me, Oi! You seem to be a traveler! Come to the counter! Oh, come to the counter! I can set you up with a room if you need it! I nodded to her and make my way to the open bar stool at the solid wood counter. So, young man, what brings you to this area? Is it fast, Quinn? It has to be. I take it... Oh. I take it it's not by it's I am not the first of my kind to walk through the through your doors. A Merc? No. You are not the first your first, but you are the first Merc I've seen come for the school. Wait, how do you Honey, I have been working in my family's tavern since I could walk. Plus, with how you carry yourself, it gives away how much you've seen. Fair enough, ma'am. So I I came a day early. Is there any rooms open for the night? Yeah, hon. Just for you, there'll be no charge. I want you to tell me some of your story, some of the stories about what you've seen. Uh, I need to put, hold on, before, let me pause real quick here. I sat there for a moment and thought, I sat there and thought for a moment. Sure, I'm okay with this trade. So over the course of an hour or so, I told her about different the different missions I have been on. Things I have witnessed, the whole nine yards. She was so enthralled and even offered me a meal for my stories that I have presented. Once I finished up the house special, mince cutlet, I stood up and headed to the room. Uh, ma'am, I never got your name. Oh, it's Rachel Guilford. I took over the family inn last year. Pleased to meet you. Same here, ma'am. As I stood up, she slid the key over to me and informed me that it was the room at the end of the hall on the left. I nodded in thanks and headed my way and head my way to the room. As I placed my hand on the railing, I could feel how worn down they feel from the years of use. As I crest the top of the stairs, it's it's a straight shot to the end of the hall where my room is. I make my way down the hall, greeted by a greeted with a paint green painted door. I turn the golden knob, and I'm greeted to a standard room. It does carry the homey feel, just like the rest of the inn has given me so far. The room has normal full-size bed, has a wooden desk with a orb lamp, a closet so I can hang some stuff if I need to. I walk into the room and I set my stuff onto the bed. And I open up my rolling suitcase. I think I shall change and walk around town. As I think this, there's a knock on my door. It was Miss Rachel. I have someone you might want to meet, so make sure you come by for dinner. Come back for dinner, okay? She's just as interesting as you... She is just as interesting as you are, young man. Before words could leave my mouth, she headed back down to the bar to keep serving her regulars. After a little while, I got dressed in my casual clothes and I stepped out of the temporary lodging. I'm wearing a slightly tight-fit white and button-down, a custom-made black and red leather jacket that crosses... After a little while, I got dressed in my casual clothes and I stepped out of my temporary lodging. I'm wearing a slight, slightly tight-fit white button down a custom made red and black and red leather jacket that crosses over the front black cargo pants and black boots i have my sword and gun holstered on both sides of my body i'm ready to use them at any moment i head down the hallway to see others going in and out of the rooms of the inn some seem to be my age while others seem to be older as i walk down the staircase i wave to miss rachel who's behind the counter she nods in recognition and continues her work 
I pushed open the front doors of the inn and got greeted with a blast of floral smell and a slight chill. I walked into the town plaza, which has seemed to be slightly, which seems to be slightly more busy than when I entered the inn earlier that day. Off in the distance, I can see the church tower, where the clock, where it has a clock on a tower. It says it's quarter past three. I still have a couple hours before the sun sets. I might as well check out some of the town to see what it has to offer. I remember that the general store had some interesting looking items out for display, so I guess I'll head over head there first. I cross over cross the open plaza and headed to Darrington's General Goods. As I get closer, I start to see all different types of items in the store showcasing on showcasing on the outside. They are starting to show off a variety of different produce from local farms in near near the town. There are different types of clothes that also seem to be made and sourced locally. There are little trinkets here and there, as well as common everyday items that one could need. I make my way past the produce and push my way through the, a set of double doors, which what followed next, I honestly was not prepared for. Once I opened the doors, I was hit with a rustic smell, but it was a pleasant, it was pleasant to the senses. I saw all, di all types of items in the store. From common items to things I never thought I would see in the country of Galeria. On the shelves are ammo boxes, sharpening rocks, minor healing orbs, medical supplies, cooking supplies. Basically anything you can think of, this store has to offer. And from what I can see, and for a decent price. I start to glance through the merchandise. I hear some arguing going on in the counter. I lift my head to see a tall male, about six foot four, wearing a black or tight black button down shirt. That might rip at any moment due to his muscles. In front of him is a slightly smaller female in a purple dress wearing a white crop top jacket and light purple floppy hat. They were arguing in a language I've only heard once or twice before when I went to Cerebonia. I believe it was a language... I believe my old man called it Irish. With That's, that's going to be a working title. I don't know if I'm going to change that or not it's kind of just uh, um a placeholder for later on so i know what kind of the language will be done the young lady seemed to be really ticked off about something and she was holding it was a small orb of some kind and it was kind of hard to see due to it moving all over the place <clears throat> what you mean this price is what do you what you mean this is twenty dollars i could easily get it for five dollars back home she exclaimed in an irish accent the thing I don't have. Ma'am, I'm really sorry, but as a fellow merchant, you must understand that there are hard times going... Uh, that they are hard to get right now. I am trying to keep it as low as possible for you students as well as the locals living here. He explains with sincerity in his voice. All right. Well, you don't... Why don't you work me out a deal, merchant to merchant? I'm starting the academy tomorrow and I'll be here for quite a while. I need a place to ship my goods and buy goods. So what do you say? Hmm. I will think about it, Missy. Once you started the academy and can offer and can offer me some steady product, we should talk. Okay, old man. I will remember that. And I'll be back soon enough. As she said that, she turned around on a dime and headed to the door with a smile. As she went by me, she turned and smiled and stated, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize there was someone else in the store. You have a great day. I nodded in reply and she proceeded out the door. As the door shuts behind her, I hear a loud sigh of relief coming from the store clerk behind the counter. I looked over and I see a grown man wiping the sweat off of his forehead with what seemed to be an aborted handkerchief. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. She is one of the newer residents of Tell. Well, you saw how that went. Is there anything I could do for you? This big, burly man stepped out from behind the counter. His sheer presence almost sent me into a fight or flight mode. He stood about stood at six foot five and had enough muscles that he could probably punch through the side of a tank. The only thing stopping me f is that this whole demeanor is that his whole demeanor is light and friendly, almost like a soft, cheerful bear of sorts. He is wearing some blue jeans and a black and black tennis shoes that matched his tight fitting black button down. He holds himself very proper, especially with his sleek black hair. Oh, uh, it, it's fine. I understand business is business. 
I walk over and meet the man in the middle of the room. He stuck his hand out, to which I proceed to do the same. It was a true testament to his power. He was holding back, but had a very firm and powerful grasp on my hand. He takes a good look at me and almost on command he blurts out, Ah, so you're a mercenary, huh? Pretty young, but that's but that is not uncommon. Looking for anything particular? I'm starting to think I might need to change my demeanor up or something. Everyone is reading me like an open book in this town. Uh, I'm new here as well. I'm just looking around to see what what I might need once school gets started. Oh, well, I offer everything for daily needs. I can also get you whatever you need within a fair price range. Question, do you have a, an orb radio? No, I do not. Why do you... Before I could finish the sentence, he pointed over to a small display of radios that had a giant sign stating, The Radio Sandman Special. I looked at it slightly confused, and that is when the merchant said, If you're new to if you're a new student, you might want to go ahead and pick up one of those radios. Radio Sandman does talk show as well as weather reports. Well, uh, I appreciate the advice. It's not unusual for a merchant f to try and look out for the new customers. <clears throat> I am passing on the favor. Had a merc save my life not too long ago. Think of this as an uh, investment or a future customer. Just remember that I can get anything and everything. I know you should have... That you should be helpful for you. I know that should be helpful for you, young sir. I nodded in agreement to which me and Mr. Durrington talked for about an hour while I looked around the store for anything I need right away. I bought a few small things along with the radio, such as notebooks pencils erasers they were also placed they were all placed in a small brown paper bag i headed over to the door mr Darrington told me about the local radio station that is found in this town radio sandman i thought i heard that name before to which i later found out that they were pretty famous all over the country i waved back and as a thank you and headed to the plaza of this quiet town i walked over to the plaza fountain and had a seat on nearby benches as I, started, as I placed my bag beside me, I leaned back and soaked in the sunlight. I was trying to get used to this kind of place. I'm used to fast-paced lifestyle. Always on the guard, keeping my wits about me. True, I'm still on guard, but I could tell that there's not much of a violent, this is not much of a violent town. Well, not yet. I've heard some rumors about Vesquin, and to be frank, I'm, kinda, I'm scared and kind of excited for what it can bring. Vestwin Military Academy, making making of the foundation of Galeria. There have been countless generations that have come through the Military Academy. It dates back all the way back to King Kyle Requiem, who stopped the country from wearing, warring within and united everyone as a whole back in 899. Minus the civil war that broke out 40 some years ago that the old man participated in, the country of Galeria has been a strong but rather peaceful place for people to live in. Leaders of all different industries have come out of this place. Military leaders, cooking stars, leaders in a technology field. Anyone you can, anyone that can make the country better, they came through the doors of Vesquin. There is one thing that makes Vesquin stand out over all military academies across the world. Strength and power is how this school works. The people with the most strength sit in the top 36 seats, which is simply known as the echelon. The fact that this is a fact that is well known all over the world, especially since the newer principal opened up, opened it up to everyone in the world, simply stating. We welcome the strongest warriors, the strongest cooks, the smartest minds. We welcome you all and hope to strengthen you and make you even better. The world was blown away with a simple statement. People started to flood to the school in an attempt to become a well known to become well known while reaching fame and riches beyond their wildest dreams. As I sat there getting my mind and thoughts straight, my daydreaming was interrupted by loud hammering coming from behind me. I shot up off the bench to see where the noise was coming from, to find out that it was over at the foundry. So since my curiosity got to me, I ended up grabbing my bag and then wandered over to the foundry, then finding myself going inside. Once I crossed the threshold of the door, a heat wave hit me in the face, which was a nice change of pace from the slight slight chilly atmosphere of the outdoors the store is made of gray stone i assume to keep the heat in and to keep customers warm 
The shelves were full of healing wave orbs. Wave weapons of all types are placed all throughout the whole store. They offer different types of maintenance items and repair kits of all kinds. That way they can help the variety of students that come to the school. As I'm going through the shelves, trying to find some maintenance gear for my sidearm, I started to overhear the conversation going on at the counter. Standing at the counter was a tanned but very beautiful woman with flowing black hair that was tied up in a ponytail and running through the back of the hat. She was wearing a tight-fitting red shirt as well as tight blue jeans that matched with the red and black sneakers. I noticed a long black case beside her that was leaning onto the counter. The man behind the counter was on the shorter side with a bald head but a decent sized salt and pepper beard. As I was looking closer at the I look at the items closer to them, I heard a lo loud roar of laughter coming from the small band. Ha 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 ha! Well, young miss, I'm glad you allowed me to th to make this weapon even better for you. You don't see Johns every day. If you need something else, come back here. Yes, sir. I appreciate the help. Make sure to tell your wife thank you for me. I appreciate the tea and cookies. As she said her thanks, she ran past me excitedly and headed out the door. I was slightly stunned by how fast and precise her movement passed me with a giant case in tow, left behind a floral scent. I stare, as I stared at the open door, I felt a small smack on the lower part of my back and heard, Yeah, she's beautiful. Ah, to be young again. As I felt the slap, I turned around to be greeted by a small man. Some might have... Some might say he could be the definition of the mythical dwarves. He stood about four foot ten, had a muscular beard, build, wearing goggles on his head. He is wearing a gray button down that is covered by his black apron, that is made for smithing. I look at him and I keep, I keep and keep a straight face. Oh no, no, I was more interested in movements than anything else. Sure, sure. <laughs> So, Sonny, what can I do for... Before I, he finished his uh, words, his eyes immediately went for the gun on my head. Hey, uh, Sonny, you mind if I take a look at that gun of yours? It's quite a piece you have there. Uh, sure, here, look to your heart's content. I had a holster the gun and hand it to the blacksmith. He hurries over to his workbench behind, behind the counter, pulling out all types of tools as he begins to examine the gun. Have... Begins examining a gun have ha, I have had. I have had for many years. Just as I was about to say something, I heard a soft female voice come from behind. I am so sorry about this. My husband gets this way when he sees something out of the ordinary. As I turn around, I am greeted by a blonde-haired woman who is about the same height as me. She is smiling, which somehow she has... Which shows she has dimples and a light hearted personality just as her husband does she is wearing a long green dress with a white apron with some brown sneakers well dear is there something i can ring up for you or help you find she walked over to the other side of the counter just barely hiding her husband i walk up to the counter with still kind of skeptical of the weird blacksmith well i was looking for some maintenance tools for the gun your husband has as well as sword maintenance equipment the stuff i bought before I could finish my sentence, I was interrupted by the small blacksmith. He came over to me and handed me my sword arm back. Very, that is a very interesting weapon you have there. I haven't seen anything like that outside of my home country, Elbane. It is very unusual to see a rotating wave, wave or barrel. Nice piece of equipment you got there. Might I add, might I well, might I add well taken care of. Thanks. My old man gave it to me a couple of years ago. I, it has saved me, saved me time and time again. Do you? So, is there a kit that I could use for these items? Already ahead of you, young lad. As he said that, he laid out two kits on the counter: one for Sistrium weapons only, and one wave or maintenance. As he slid them towards me, as at the pick up the box, I searched for the price of some sort that would indicate a price. That is when he said, oh, don't worry about the price, young lad. I'm going to give you a discount since you gave me a piece of home, and I haven't had that in a long time. As for an apology for getting into my work, have some lunch with us. 
My beautiful wife makes a mean sandwich. She giggles and heads to the back room, to which I assume to make food. I am not the one to be rude at such kindness. So, I gladly take up the offer of the kind owner of the foundry. Joey Matai and his wife, Margaret Matai. So we sat around the table, enjoying some freshly made lemonade and sandwiches. I got to know more about this lovely couple. Joey, from a young age, set out to become one of the best blacksmiths known in the world, and hopes to be a great honor to his to bring great honor to his family. I learned a little bit about his home country of Bain, which is mostly mountain ranges and valleys with villages mixed in. I also learned he met his wife in it when he was in his early twenties, and after thirty different times, he find she finally agreed to uh, to go on a date. So after an hour chatting and eating, I decided to head out and thank them properly for by, and leaving some money on the counter for the kits they gave me. It would have bothered me if I didn't if I didn't leave anything for the great service they gave me. As I shut the door behind me, I turned towards the church tower to see that it is close to five in the afternoon. I look around and notice that the lamp post throughout the town dimly lit, even though the sun was still up, but slowly setting. I start to walk around the town and try to get a lay of the land. I walk down to the main road. Main road. I don't know what I say round. Main road past the fountain that leads to Vesquin. Down, the, down this road you can see a multitude of things from different dorms to the pathway that leads directly to the church. Since I'm nearby I decided to go in and make a quick prayer for my fallen comrades. As I push open the double doors of this old church, I am greeted with a faint smell of candles and old books in front of me. I see a long red carpet that runs the length of the building, leading to a stone altar at the back of the church. As I walk down the main aisle, I notice there are only a handful of pews in this church, as well as one other door that isn't the main entrance located to the back, to the right, back towards the back right of the altar. I walk up, say a prayer to the goddess Sagi, to watch over my fallen comrades, as well as rest for the mystic wolves that are somewhere else in this world. As I finish my prayer, I lift my head back up and make my way towards the door. I pass the father of the church. As I do, I give him a nod of sign of thanks, and then I proceed to leave the church. I proceed to walk down... Well, I do a lot of proceeding, don't I? I proceed to walk down the church's stone stairs, and once I get to the bottom, I hear a loud bang from the alleyway near the church. Me being the curious person I am, I head towards that direction with my hand on my gun just in case. I walk towards the alley and all I can hear is nasally snickering. Once I round the corner, I see four guys in school uniforms that are black, cornering this girl that is on the shorter side. She has light blue hair and is wearing welding goggles on her head. The group of asshole, <laughs> the group of assholes were blocking everything else from view. I realized the situation at hand, some words of the old man went through my head. Whenever you see a lady in trouble, always rush to the rescue. As his words came to my mind, the ringleader stated, Look, I already have I already had two broads turn me in today, and some asshat gunsmith caused me trouble. You're gonna <laughs> Oh my god, these words coming out of mouth. You listen here, big tits, I'm Ron Hepper, six two C of the Echelon. You will do. I stepped closer to the group to get a good angle in the group. Then I yelled. Oh, hey, there you are. I've been looking all over for you, sis. With that statement, I slipped into the group of guys with my back to her giving her some giving to her giving some protection. Who the hell are you? That is coming from the snobby leader who looks like he could rip apart. Looks like he could rip a pillow of. Could rip a pillow. Couldn't. I'm pretty sure that was supposed to be couldn't. So we'll do that live editing right here. Couldn't rip a pillow. Let alone hit me and leave a bruise. These three minions. Chimed in. Trying to back him up and make him sound intimidating. Look. Look. I am a brother and we are trying to finish her shopping before. Like hell. We aren't done with her yet. You leave her, leave her alone so we can play. <laughs> Sadly, no. She's heading out with me, bud. When I say this, Ron got really close to me, to the point where I could smell the lunch he had eaten earlier. It was a very foul stench. But odd, oddly enough, it wasn't the worst I have smelled. 
You don't know who you're messing with, bud. Same for, same for you. I suggest you and your cronies leave before you get hurt. I am Ronald Hemp. I am one of the... He points his, his finger into my face. And the moment he does that, almost an instant, I swing my arm around and punch him in the face. <laughs> sending him flying ten feet down the alleyway. Once his lackeys realized what happened to their leader, they ran over to his aid. As I watched them make sure they don't make any moves towards me, I felt a soft lump against my back, to which a soft whisper follows, thank you so much. I turn around and finally get a good look at the stranger that I just saved. Standing around five foot four, she is just under my chest bone. She is a silky, smooth, light blue hair. She is all... She is, to say, well endowed for her age, but carries a sense of maturity with her. She has a pair of welding goggles on her head as well as a small scar that is located on her left cheek. She is dressed in a gray baggy t-shirt, brown cargo pants, and brown boots. Before I can say a word, I hear a pain-filled statement down the alley. You have messed up! You will face the wrath of the echelon! He struggles to stand and starts to make his way towards me. In one fluid motion, I unhook my gun from its holster and raise it to eye level and fully in and arm fully extended. I was taught not to raise the gun unless I had intention to take a life. Unless I intend to take a life. So if you don't walk away from this now, you're going to know the meaning of real pain. As I cock my pistol. Man, I am time breaking some laws here, I'm pretty sure. As I cock my pistol, fully intended to fight these fools. As when they hurry down the alleyway as fast as they can. I swiftly holstered my gun and turned back to the female, just to be greeted with a hug. I pat her on the head as just she was a small child. To me, she does give off the, the vibes of a little sister. She suddenly stops and realizes what she has done. She proceeded to back away and starts to profusely apologize. To start profusely apologize. Starts to profusely apologize. There you go. I am so sorry. I was just so relieved that I... That it didn't go south. I mean, I could fight and such, but not against that many people. Oh, I'm so sorry. It, it's okay. It's okay. I'm just glad to hear that the idiot slammed his hand. I'm just glad I heard that idiot slam his hand against the wall. Oh, let me pay you for... No, don't don't worry about it. I didn't have the kindness of my heart. Just tell me your name, miss. And are, so are you a local here? She steps back so she can properly introduce me. I'm Aurora Rivet. Revelt. I am from the town of Provis. I came here in hopes to start at Vesquin and become a better inventor. As she finishes, she tilts her head and has a huge grin on her face when she strikes a weird but cheerful pose. I guess this is a topic she she loves to talk about. Well, I'm Jackson Mitchell. Some people call me Hawkeye. The people call me Hawkeye. Nice to meet you. Then I stick my hand out, to which she gladly does the same in response. As we pull our hands away, she spoke up once more. Are you from around here? Let me pay you back by for helping me getting out of this situation. Then she tilts her head and, and thinks. At least let me buy you dinner for over at the Inn and Tavern. Before I could speak, she grabbed my hand and started to pull me along. I won't lie to you, it feels nice to be appreciated once in a while. I never got this feeling whenever we did a job, no matter what kind it was. As she pulled me along we get, and we got closer to the Guilford Inn, the sun began to set and the street lights began to illuminate the streets of this peaceful place. I start to think of myself, start to think to myself, I might be able to get used to this kind of lifestyle. As we walk into the inn, Rachel waves to me and signals over at the empty, to the empty table in the corner. Me and Aurora make, make our way through the almost packed inn. As we sit down at the table, Rachel comes over and slaps me on the back. Look at you, lady, you lady killer. Gone for a couple hours, you already come back with one hell of a catch. Before I could speak, Aurora spoke up in, def up in our defense. N no, ma'am. He saved me from a group of guys that were harassing me. If he didn't show up when he did, she started, at that point, she started to tear up. That's when Rachel walked over and patted her on the head. I guess I'm not the only one that sees her as a young, younger sister. Once fi Rachel finishes calming down Aurora, she places two cups of water on the table. Then she hands us a couple menus. Get it whatever you want. Since Jackson here is such a hero, food will be on me. With this, a smile came over Aurora's face, and then she put up the menu, put a menu on her face, and took her time looking. Rachel, you you don't have to do this. Oh, it's no problem, Jack. You did something a lot of the town folks were too scared to do. 
Plus, due to the orders of someone you're gonna meet, it's on them. So don't be afraid. After those words leave her mouth, she rushes back to the counter to continue to serve the basses that take up the area. I did not know at that time. Those words she spoke will have a whole new meaning in the upcoming day. That aside, I know I got to know Aurora a little more. I found out that she was a has a natural knack for making inventions, weapons, basically anything you can think of. She helped anything you can think of. She helped put her hometown on the map for tourism, trying to make her father's life better and more fulfilling. While we were waiting on food, she asked me about she asked about why I'm here, who I am. So I told her my backstory. She seemed like the type of person who wouldn't who doesn't judge on your past, but uh, but but on how you act from that point forward. As Rachel came over and put some burgers on the table, I started to tell Aurora the backstory on how I got here. So to those who are watching this video, by the way, and those in chat, I don't know if I'm going to keep this here. I might change this part later on because realistically, this is a lot to just dump on someone. But for this point, and I'm not going to change it here live. So for right he now, this is going to stay here, and this interaction is going to stay the same. I don't remember much of my childhood, minus the smell of gunpowder and blood. I remember the feeling of being hungry, tired, and cold all the time. One day I wandered through the streets of a nameless war-torn town in some country in the world. I was losing all hope and strength as I gathered up that I had gathered up to this point. I ended up crawling into the, some ruins of a destroyed building, destined to die. Then, as if some, as if an angel sent by Sagi herself, an older man found me in the ruins of that destroyed building, withering away slowly but surely. He slowly reached his hand out to me, but I do not remember what happened immediately after that. The next thing I knew, I woke up in a bed in some inn somewhere, cleaned and freshened up. I slowly got out of the bed and slowly walked over to the nearest mirror. It was the first time I've ever seen myself. I was clearly malnourished. You could see every bone pretty much. I had slumped in eyes with huge bags underneath. As I sat there and started stared at that creature stared at the creature that was before me. I heard the door open and with a deep thunderous voice Ho 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 I see you're finally awake. I turned to the voice in that direction to see a towering muscular figure in front of me, with his long flowing silver hair and his smooth skinned vase. I also noticed one key feature, and his right hand his right hand was missing, and in its place was a mechanical limb. He shut the door behind him and walked over to a small table in the corner of the room. As we walked past as we walked as he walked past me I could smell something that smelled like the gods themselves that made him made it. He proceeded to, to set it on the table and turned to me and saying what are you waiting for, young... What are you staring at, young child? Come, come! Eat to your heart's content, but take your time. We don't need you to throw it all back up. I proceeded to cautiously walk over and sit down. In front of me were simple eggs and bacon. Nothing fancy. Nothing too fancy. But when I took the first bite, I, could stop, I couldn't stop myself from finishing everything in front of me. As I finished the entire plate, I felt tears running down my face. I broke down into a crying spree. That is when the older man came over and squatted down and stared at me and stared into my eyes. You feel this feeling right? I have a question for you, young one. Do you want to continue walking the streets with nothing to live for? No food at the end of the night? No clothing? No shelter to keep you warm? Or do you want to fight for a new beginning? Fight for a whole new being? Making a brand new person? I nodded in agreement and continued to cry. Well then, young child, do you have a name? I proceeded to shake my head. Well, young one, from this day forward, you will go by the name of Jackson Mitchell. You are now a member of the mercenary group known as the Mystic Wolves. Also, for those who are uh, watching the video and seeing on chat, uh, you see some people have gone through and uh, edited and left some notes, which, you know, casually changing over time. As I finished my story, I placed down the glass I was sipping from and I look up to see Aurora tearing up. I reach out. I reach out in slight panic, mostly due to the fact I've never been in situation before. That was a weird little glitch. 
I'm sorry, I didn't mean to start crying. I just, I haven't heard something this sad before. As she started to wipe away her tears, Rachel came over to the table and started to collect the dishes that we had piled up. She started to walk over when she turned around and said, Our guest of honor should be here shortly. So sit back and relax a while. At this point, Rachel walked away. I started to look around and noticed that most, most of the inn is empty now. A few people scattered throughout the place, but it was kind of quiet, especially compared to the bustling atmosphere we walked into just an hour ago. So as I sat down, or sat there and swapped stories with Aurora, the night rolled on with laughter and cheer in the air. The locals came over to greet me and asked me about my life. That is when it finally hit me that both her and I are going to go down similar paths. We looked over at the clock that is above the bar to see that it is about, it is now half past nine. And it's almost cue, almost on cue that I let out a slight yawn. Aurora looked up from her glass and saw it happen. You okay? I bet you're tired from what happened earlier. I shake my head. Oh no, I'm perfectly fine. I'm just waiting for someone I'm supposed to meet through Rachel. Rachel over there. I just don't know when and who I'm supposed... As I spoke, a I felt a feminine hand on my right shoulder and a female voice with a slight robotic undertone from behind me. I take it from that statement, you must be the mark I'm supposed to meet. Oh, here comes the... I'm kind of proud of this character here. <clears throat> I turn around to be greeted by a stunning female. But the moment I laid on this person, I felt a way of overcome my body of fear and power that emanated from her. I stood up to be greeted by the strong presence. She stood the same height as me. She has a beautiful platinum colored hair that goes past her shoulders. I have never seen a shade never seen a shade that beautiful in my life. Around her neck I saw a small black choker in the center of it is a light wave orb. They are very rare to find. Even with the new exploration into this element even with the new exploration into this element. She is wearing a emerald green button down with a row of golden buttons on each side of her shirt. She is wearing a matching colored skirt that goes down to her knees, which is accompanied by black leggings. Out of the corner of my eye, I can barely make out the green ribbon that is a, that is on the small of her back. I was so distracted by her that I did not notice she was also sizing me up. But I feel like it was a different way. Um, how can I help you? Oh, um, how can I help you? Aurora spoke up, breaking the tension that was starting to form. The mysterious girl cleared her throat and began to speak. I noticed the choker orb began to light up as if it was a weapon. Oh, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Usually when I meet a tough opponent, I tend to size them up. She places this bag down and she places this bag down and I honestly didn't notice. She sticks her hand out for a handshake. Hanukkah Mignol. I, I think that's how you pronounce it. Mignol. At your service. I proceeded to shake her hand. Then Aurora stands up and proceeds to do the same. At that moment, Rachel o comes over and places fresh lemon tea and cookies on the table. She nods to the girl and walks away. Hanukkah then pulls out a chair and takes a seat. To pro proceeding to gesture that we do the same. Do the same. To which me and Aurora... Look at each other and do the same. Do as well. Boop. So you must be <sighs> Hanukkah tilts her head to the side. Miss Aurora Revelt. I assume Aurora nods. <clears throat> well, I am one of Vesquin Mil Academy's runners. So I'm here to give you guys your school uniforms, your student guidebook, and some other goodies as a gift from the student council. As she finishes her sentence, she stands up and places two brown paper bags on the table. She then slides the bags to, to the prospective new owners. Inside you will, have, you will find five uniforms that are your size. She looks over at me and smiles for some reason. Along with the student handbook and notebook, you, along with the student handbook slash notebook, use them how you seem fit is totally up to you. You will also have a key that corresponds with your new lodgings in the student living quarters. You will either have no roommate or one, and then proceed, 
and just depending on where you land with the rooming situation. Any questions? She quickly looks through these items. <clears throat> oh, man, I can't read. She then proceeds to sip on a freshly made lemon tea and eats a cookie. As me and Aurora quickly go through these items, look through these items, I raise my head and ask a simple question. When and where is the orientation held? She sips more on her tea and clears her throat. That's when I notice the orb, the, or the orb lights up again. Or the orb light up again. Oh, it's at 8 a.m. in the morning over at the auditorium. So make sure you, both of you are well rested and not late. She glances over at the clock on the wall showing that it's at 10 at night. She slowly starts to get up to which me and Aurora do the same. Well, well, it... It is time for me to go, get going and get, get some sleep. I suggest you suggest you guys do the same. She places down the cup of tea and steps away from the table. As she walks out the door, as she walks out the door, as she does, waves in the air, signaling a friendly goodbye. Me and Aurora just looked at each other, still confused on what happened. All we know is that we're all set to go with our uniforms and have a place to go tomorrow morning. So after we finally get our wits about us, we grab our stuff and that would gra grab the stuff that was given to us along with all the goodies that were brought today and headed to the rooms after thanking Rachel for her amazing hospitality. As we reach the top of the stairs, Aurora's room was located in near the front of the hallway. So we agreed to meet downstairs tomorrow at 7 a.m. Eat and head to the orientation as it is warranted by our newfound friendship. I made her made my way down the hall after we said goodbye. As I stepped down the hall, I could hear creaking of the of the wood below me. It seems that everyone else in the inn has already made their way to the room and, for the night. As I opened the door, I walked in and put my bags on the edge of the bed. I proceeded. I then proceeded to unload my mysterious package that was given to me, given to us not long ago. And the following it. In it was the following contents. Five white button-down shirts, five red uniform jackets with the school crest on the right breast pocket, five black slacks, a, a student handbook and journal, and a device that was in the shape of a watch. I picked up this device and took and take a good look at it, trying to figure out what the real meaning and purpose is. After a couple minutes, I gave up on figuring it. Gave up. Gave up on trying to figure it out and set it on the dresser, beside the clothes that I will be worn tomorrow. That is when I remember about the radio. The radio I was gifted earlier today. I walk over to the smaller bag on the on my bed and pull out the portable radio out of the bag. That is when I set it up on the dresser. After fine-tuning it, I was able to pick up Radio Sandman's talk show, The Gentle Try. This is a shout-out to a podcast group that I listen to. It looks like I just caught it as it started up. I heard a catchy, jazzy song start to play as the show began. <clears throat> What's up, you salty salmons? This is the Gentle Dry Talk Show. I am your host, Johnny the Guitar Hand, with my co-host, co Grant, a.k.a. the Thai Wonder, and Greg the 99%. The group started to bust out laughing, and that's when Greg spoke up. Well, it was certainly a, a new intro for us. Well, for all the new students that are here or on the way to the on the way to Vesquin Academy, welcome to the Gentle Tribe Podcast. Grant starts to speak up. Yes, welcome new students and old to the No Pizza Oh my god, I get to rewrite this. To the No Pizza Cross Gang and to everyone in between. That is when Johnny interrupted. No, 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 we are not starting this today. As the trio laughed talked and laughed i polished my sword and didn't maintenance to my gun having them talk in the background really did help the time pass i do see myself la listening to these guys more often might even become a loyal listener as i sit there and listen away i started to wonder what tomorrow might bring forth <laughs> yeah i forgot about that part too uh i mean i have been in life-threatening situations for but for some reason a wave of nervousness came over my body I shrug it off and I stare at my new attire that the school gave me. It was pressed and seemed to be very brand new. As I picked it up, I saw a new sworn it, sw sewn in school crest over the right hand breast pocket. That's when I noticed there was something inside the pocket. 
I flipped it open, flipped open the pocket flap to pull out a small piece of paper. As I flipped it open, I noticed there was only a few words. You better be ready. I am a little confused. I still know a threat when I see one. With this in mind, I make sure to tend to my holster extra carefully as I double down on maintenance and cleaning. These words in my mind, I, ha I will have to tread carefully tomorrow. I mean, might need to warn Aurora to, in case, just in case, since we're both heading to the school at the same time. As I ponder on what to do, I hear the radio in the distance. Well, now that we're done with Johnny and Grant's weird takes, let me just say this once again. Welcome to all the new students of Vesquin, to Vesquin. The new, the weather should be good tomorrow for during your orientation. Well, boys, I say we sign off for tonight, for the night. With that, Grant takes over the microphone until, Grant takes over the microphone. Until next time, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. As they sign off, the same jazzy music played as the first, as when they first started. Played once more, which followed by commercials of local stores. I headed over and turned off the radio. As I do notice, that is now, it is now midnight and I should head to sleep, head to bed. As I dress down into my sleeping wear, I start to plan out possible events that may occur tomorrow at the orientation. As I lay my head in bed, or as I lay in bed, I stare at the ceiling, getting lost in thought. At some point, I drifted off to the noise of silence that has overtaken my room. I wake up to a small, fluffy creature pecking at the window of my room. I slowly rub my eyes. I see I see it is a white baby Wulko with a strut with a black stripe going down the middle. Wolko are a mixture of a sheep that is super round with a pair of wings that tend to be super friendly towards humans. I slowly get out of bed and walk over to the window and push open the double frames. As I do, small a small the small Wolko flies back in back then to return to the windowsill. Almost as asking as it is asking to be petted. So I did what any good Galarian Glacierian, the Glacian, I guess. I don't know how, I don't know how I wrote that. Does and pet it softly while watching the sun peek over the horizon in the distance. I turn around to take a look at the old wooden clock to see it say, while well, to see that it says six a.m. Not enough time to do my daily workout, but I'm thinking I think missing one day won't hurt, especially since I have a bad feeling about the orientation that will take place soon. I pet the wool coat one last time, lean down and say, Hey, little guy, I'm going to step away to get ready for the day. And as I do, it looked like it acknowledged me and flew away. As it goes a safe distance, I shut the windows and get ready in my new uniform. It was tight, but a very comfortable fit. As I slide the slacks on, I do a couple squats to test the movement I have. Whoever designed these outfits had fighters in mind when choosing everything that they made these clothes. Once I put on the button-up shirt, as well as the jacket, I do a couple practice punches as well as to test to see how much arm movement I have with the jacket. To my luck, it is as much mo much room as, as as if I did not have a jacket on. Once I get my uniform on, I walk over to the mirror to make sure that everything looks good. Once that is done, I strap my holster and sidearm that is underneath my pillow. I walk around to the foot of the bed and I pick up and place the black uh, pick up the long black case on the end of the bed. I flick open the two latches and pop to the pop the top revealing my centaur and especially made and it's especially made back holster. It's supposed to be specially made but it says especially I'll change it later. I proceeded to do the to a quick rub down with the cloth as it is located inside the cloth. Once I do, I throw the rag back in and close the case. Once I do, I pick it up and set it back on the floor at the foot of the bed. I start to gather all my luggage and made a small pile at the foot of the bed where the sword case is. Once I grab my leather satchel out of the suitcase, I walk over to the dresser where the, all my school stuff is. Pens, pencils, small tool kit for the gun. I started to load all the items into the satchel and put on this very mysterious, put on the mysterious watch device. I suppose we'll find out soon enough once everything at school kicks off. Once I finish up, I walk over to the door and head out. I turn around to, to close it. 
I felt the presence of nobody in the hallway. I do suppose it's pretty early in the morning. I head down the hall while I'm making sure not to wake up any of the other guests in the inn. Once I begin my descent down the stairs, I notice that Rachel was switching out with one of her workers who was working, who took the night shift. Once we made eye contact, I wave as a greeting, to which I'm greeted with the same gesture. I find myself sitting at the table, and Aurora were the same table me and Aurora were last night. Once I get settled, Rachel comes over with a fresh cup of coffee. Rachel, how do you know I drink this drink coffee? As she places the cup down, she looks at me and stares. Honey, I've been doing this since I could walk. I know a coffee drinker when I see one. After that, she places down a small breakfast menu on the table and walk back to the bar counter. One, one of the menu, one of the menu was, the menu was a couple simple items from eggs and bacon to fruit and everything in between. After a couple minutes of staring at the small menu, I decided to order some eggs with fruit. Rachel Mundus noticed, might have, must have noticed I was done to the fact as soon as I lifted my head, she was ready to go. Once I placed, once she took my order and put it to the chef in the back, me and her started chatting for a couple minutes. To which she informed me I can leave my stuff in my room until later tonight once I settle into my new quarters with the school. After a couple of minutes, she came back with my food. Two simple, I, my food, with my food, a simple two eggs over medium, two things of toast and some fruit. Once she placed it on the table, we hear a soft voice from the stairs. Mm, good morning. We both look towards the stairs to see a barely awake Aurora. She is fully dressed in a blue uniform that is very similar to mine. She has a satchel, which I see some tools sticking out, and as she has her goggles on her head. I stand up the greet as she comes to the table. She slowly pulls out her chair and flops down. She's still trying to wake herself up. She slowly combs through the menu and decides what she wanted to eat. After Aurora finally got some food in her, she perked up right she perked right on up. Once this happened, Rachel walked over and told her the same thing told she same thing she told me about her luggage. I happened to look up and see that it was 7.30 a.m. Orientation was going on soon. So I finished sipping the coffee and set down the mug. Uh, thanks for the breakfast, Rachel. We need to get going. Only money on the table. Appreciate it, hon. Don't, don't let the first day overwhelm you guys, okay? That's when Aurora stood up from the table and thanked her as well. Once I put the money on the table, me and Aurora made our way to, out to the street. The scene was very different from when we first arrived yesterday. The streets were flooded with students, of, with students all over. From returning students to brand new ones that are starting the first time today. It was a sea of red, blue, green, and yellow uniforms, as far as the eye can see. I noticed amongst the sea of uniforms, there was a wide range of weapons as well. I saw everything from swords to maces and shields, as well as every kind of gun you can think of. As I sat there trying to study the sea of people, Aurora already started, already walking out towards the wave of people going past the fountain. Once I realized, I started to make my way behind her. We mixed into the crowd of students heading towards the mighty Vesquin Military Academy. As we followed the crowd towards the campus, I started to take note of the of this particular reason. Take note for this particular reason? I think four. Most of the buildings that are outlined in the dorms and most of the buildings that are outlined that outline it are dorms and houses. I can read. Let's see here. Doo -doo -doo -doo. I noticed that the dorm buildings seem to be about four stories tall and colored just like our uniforms. There are a single building. There was a single building that didn't stand out much. A black colored building it was a rectangular size, rectangular size, and about three stories tall. I was curious about why that building was made to stand out the most compared to the rest. As me and Aurora continued to the onto the brick laid path, we noticed that the front gates were decorated with flowers and balloons. By the gate, there seemed to be students and some teaching staff to help guide the students and answer questions. Once we got to the gates, I noticed that the students who were passing out pamphlets had orange armbands on stating student council. I take one, I take one and once I look up, I am taken back by what laid in front of me. The campus grounds were massive. The front gate led 
straight into the main building, which was about three to four stories tall and seemed to be made of a mixture of steel and brick. Over, f over the main entrance was the... Over, fr over the front entrance of the main building was a glass strip of two windows that are side by side and led all the way to the top of the building. There are windows placed all over the walls. You can make out different classrooms and other buildings that could... Other... Make out the different classrooms and offices. As we walk down the brick lane road, off to the right in the distance were a couple other buildings that I could not make out too much of. To the left was an enormous circular building, which I could not see the top due to being so close. It was almost in the shape of a dome of sorts. And at eye level were a bunch of doors and students, new and old, were funneling into. So just as before, me and Aurora followed, them to the ma followed the masses into the stadium-like structure to be greeted with a massive hall filled with a massive hall filled with statues, benches, and plants. As we walked the statue, walked by the statues, I glanced at the nameplates of the former student gowns. They are bleh, I can read. I glanced at the nameplate. To see that they are the former student council presidents. They seem to be made a made by the year they graduate. Made by the year they are gra they graduate. As we continue to follow the crowd, we passed what seemed to be empty food stalls. I assume they let the town hold events here to boost the local economy. As we continued, we go through the open slit into the wall to be greeted by a huge open air stadium. Covering the seat with what seemed to be a battlefield in the center at ground level. The ceiling was covered in seats, but... The ceiling was covering the seat. Seats. But there was an open center to it, so it exposed the battlefield below. Seating surrounds this, the field. Oh, I, I had a stroke or something right at this. Seating surrounds the field all around, giving f a good viewing point for the spectators no matter where they sit. As I look around, I notice signs stating specific seatings for the first year students. I pointed out to Aurora and we both had the way to find our seat. Once we find some mid row, find some mid row. I take a take the sheath sword from my back and take a seat, placing it in between my feet so that way I'm not taking up too much room. Aurora does the same, and she does. And when she does, she pulls something out. I failed to see up until this point. She was carrying a wrench about the half the size of her on her back. She pulled it off and did the same thing. I did with my sword. I sat there in awe, to which she tilted her head and simply stated, "What is something wrong?" We sat there for a little while, making small talk with other fellow students as they started to fill the seats around us. I started to notice something odd. The student population only fills the lower part of the stadium. Meanwhile, the top seemed to stay empty. I was po as I was pondering this, a loud horn went off, catching everyone's attention in the stadium. <clears throat> to which the talking simmered down and everyone was looking towards the battlefield in the middle of the stadium. Suddenly, a tall, older-looking gentleman and a young female student walked onto the field. As they walked closer to the middle of the field, some sort of scream began to come down from the ceiling above us. I have never seen anything like that before. When I leaned over to Aurora and asked about it, she was just, just completely enthralled. She was just completely enthralled in it. Okay. At some point, she took out a small blue leather-bound notebook and started writing down notes. Before I could even speak, a loud fuzzy streak came over, came from the middle of the field. To which the female student tapping was tapping some sort of device in her hand. Every time she did, it would echo throughout the stadium. At the same time, a loud buzz was heard. All of the all of a sudden, we could see two people in the middle of the field. Unfortunately, from where we were sitting, it was kind of hard to see them. It was in a mixture, in the mix of everyone's confusion, a female began to speak. When she did, a, sm a familiar, slightly robotic female voice rang out. Hello, everyone! New and old! 
It is so good to be here in everyone's presence. The female stepped forward. That is when I noticed that it was Hanukkah. I then noticed that she was in a black school uniform with a red with red stripes going down the arm. Going down the arm. After a quick pause, she continued. I am student council president Hanukkah Mignal. I am in charge of all the events. The audience claps for her. So before the principal speaks to everyone, I would like to answer one important question you all have. And I will go into detail later. Yes, the echelon does exist. And yes, from this moment forward, you can challenge them. A mumble of confusion breaks out amongst the crowd. I was part of the confusion as well as Aurora. All of a sudden, a loud, deep voice overcomes the stadium. Welcome, everyone, students new and old. I am the principal of this prestigious military academy. My name is Jordan Hales. The moment, the moment he mentioned his name, excited mumbles overcame the crowd. I am here to ensure the future of Galeria with everyone here. This school will test your knowledge, skills, and well-being. You will be pushed to your limits, and here we expect you to excel past them. Either it be in fighting, cooking, machinery, writing, whatever you have to offer to make this country even greater. Let us use a statement from the former king, from the former king, Requiem, used when he was found, when he founded this academy. Go forth, my young stallions. Bring greatness to your life and to the country of Galeria. These words are the foundation we here at the school live and breathe on. So take these words to heart, to heart, my young stallions. And take on the world. The audience stands up clapping and cheering the speech the principal gave to the student body. As we stood there, I took a closer look at the man in the middle of the field. He stood about six foot five, towering over Hanukkah, who was standing beside him. He is a, he is a black male wearing a black formal suit, which pairs well with his long snow white hair. I am un unable to make out out too much I am unable to make out too much from here from where I'm sitting as the audience is clapping and cheering and the cheering died down Hanukkah took the device and started speaking again to the crowd so now I will address something and then we shall break off to where you need to go for classes that info will be located in everyone's handbooks that was given all of a sudden her tone changed and as she started to change topics it was a deep, serious tone that it, that honestly impressed me with her, that her device can do. The echelon, the top 36 students of the academy. Some of you folks in the crowd may not know who they are and what they stand for. I'm here to, I'm here to tell you today they are positions you want to aim for. Each spot comes with amazing perks, such as, before she could finish the statement... A voice overcame the stadium. It sounded familiar for some reason. So, number one. I don't... Yeah. So, number one. I do not have a... So, number one. But I have a score to schedule. Score to settle with somebody. What? So, number one. But I have a score to settle with some of the new fresh meat coming in. As this voice over comes over, I see off to the left. I don't know what that is. I must have messed up somewhere. We'll fix that later. As a voice comes over, I see off in the left-hand side of the field, five guys in black uniforms walking towards the center of the field. That is when the screen suddenly changed to the five guys that were on. And the five guys were on the screen. Once I look, took a look, I know where, where I've heard those voices before. They were the guys that were harassing Aurora yesterday. They they make their way to the center of the battlefield to meet up with the principal and Hanukkah. They were discussing something that could not be picked up, but Hanukkah seemed very upset. That is when the main guy turned towards the crowd and pointed in pointed in mind at Aurora's direction. Jackson Mitchell and Aurora Revelt, you have dared to stand against the echelon yesterday and caused me embarrassment. For that, you two must be made an example of. When he said that, I went ahead and stood up to which Aurora did the same. You're not the only ones that have a bone to pick with. He points to the left of me. 
Ty Parker and Faye, Faye McDowell. You two going out of your way trying to get me. You two got in the way of me trying to get to know the new before he can finish. I hear yelling in the distance. That's what that would be called borderline molestation. Oh my god, I really put that. I <laughs> I looked over to, to where the yelling was coming from to see a woman I saw at the foundry yesterday. Beside her was a small black female with a, with light purple hair. It was the kind it was kind of hard to make out more from the, from this position. I looked back at the screen to see a man in the field getting furious due to what she said. And that's when she when he turned about 90 degrees and pointed to the crown once more. And then you two over there, John Schwartz and Liz Valentine, you stop me from once again. The, the irate man was interrupted by the guy who stood up in that direction, extorting small mom and pop shops. I don't think they need that here from the distance. I can make out, I can make out that he is just a bit taller than me and has silver hair. Two rows back from him stood a female familiar, that looked familiar, but it's too far to get a good, clear look at her. I look back at the screen to see him boiling red at this point from pure anger. That is when his minions surrounded him and apparently calmed him down. He took a deep breath and spoke again. I am Ronald Hemp. I am the current rank of 6'2", and I hereby officially challenging all six of you to a fight here and now on the battlefield. In front of everyone, he stepped forward for a more impactful speech i am telling you the stakes that are at hand i am telling you the stakes that are at hand if you lose you'll be kicked out of the academy before you even start but i was told that i have to put something up as well per the student council president so i'm offering up our spots the moment he said that the look on his goons faces were pure shocked i suppose they were not made of this agreement loud mutters overcame the crowd that's when hanukkah spoke once more so you hear it here folks to much of my dismay, there will be a fight here today. People's futures are on the line, careers are at stake. So be sure to come back to your seats in 30 minutes. With that statement alone, the crowd went wild. I just shook my head at the fact that six people's fates are now in the balance of some jackass because of some jackasses. Now we shall see how this plays out for everyone involved. And that's the end of chapter one. Let me know what you guys think. Um, this is going to be an hour and some change video going up on YouTube with a little bit of edits because of the pauses and stuff. So yeah, let me know what you all think. Um, and thank you for voting in the polls. Appreciate you all. And I'll see you all later. Bye-bye. <laughs>